Are there any matters we have? I did some additional research last night. It was a, it's regarding some of the matters that were raised yesterday, uh, primarily on redirect. And um, in, in checking the case law before, I, and, and as I said, this came up late in the day yesterday, and I didn't, certainly didn't want to raise this in front of the jury. The, um, the state was permitted to ask Mr. or Officer Kimball questions about um, what he thought was odd or strange about the defendant's answers or things he wrote or didn't write. He was also allowed to opine about the, uh, what he believes he saw in the truck and his opinion on what that meant uh, when the truck turned down. Maybe it was Green, maybe it was Milford Street, I don't recall. Um, I wanted to check on the, the law. Those are the kind of things that go directly to uh, the province of the jury. It, it, it goes directly to allowing a witness to testify as to their opinion by a police officer, not an expert, but still as a trained investigator as to what he believes the evidence showed. And more concerning to me, what he believed about my client. So by saying things which he said was strange or odd, that is, go, that is the same as opining about his opinion about her truthfulness and credibility. And I note, Your Honor, I looked up some cases. State versus Rivera at 169 Con App, 343. Um, more importantly, LaPointe versus Commissioner, 316 Connecticut, 225, so specifically at note 83. That's a 2015 Connecticut Supreme Court case. State versus George A, the letter A, 308 Connecticut, 274. My concern, Your Honor, is at the beginning of this case, before evidence start, I filed two motions in limine. One specifically dealt with um, law enforcement opinion regarding the credibility or truthfulness of the defendant. The other one filed um, the same day was a motion in limine to preclude testimony that t contains or references speculative statements, theories, or opinions of law enforcement. Based on practice book section 42-15, I raised these issues because I was aware, because I had this case for years, I've reviewed everything, there was a danger that this type of prejudicial evidence and interference with because police have made these speculative statements in reports and in opinions. If Your Honor ever read the arrest warrant, half of it is their theory or opinion that is not based on fact. It's based on their own, I would submit, uh, strained references and uh, speculation. But what makes this particularly concerning to me, Your Honor, is that I had asked that these matters be at least addressed at the beginning, Your Honor, I think used the the um, metaphor about you were going to slow pitch this, if I remember, regarding some of these issues, and wait till they came, came up during the trial. Well, at least these motions put the state on notice that these were issues I was concerned about, and it would have, I would have thought, it would have behooved the state to then say there are a couple of matters at this point we are going to get into these issues and we need a ruling on whether they're coming in or not. The court has suggested somehow that cross-examination will take care of these issues. I submit that that's impossible once the bell is rung um, or, and it's impossible to unring the bell on these matters that are prejudicial. And I suggest that because they go to issues that the jury must decide, they directly impact the defendant's constitutional right to fair trial, to jury, to a jury deciding the facts of the case rather than police officers, and more importantly, uh, to due process and the right to prepare a defense. Um, since we anticipated these matters at the beginning and the court did not rule, and I will note that there's another matter that's gonna come up today on the same issue that I'm assuming a, a number of police officers are gonna give their opinion about a red truck that passes in one or two seconds on on one or more highways and they're just say yeah that's the Tacoma that's the same vehicle whatever I'm assuming that's what's happening today and that's why it's important to raise this now um, 
I understand that the that I also objected to these matters on the record, incited opinion, improper opinion. The jury can decide this what they heard for themselves, etc. And I was overruled on those issues. Um, and we did uh, express concern, and it's impossible, I think, once the jury hears this, to be able to unring that bell. It was unduly prejudicial to allow this witness, and again, it was on redirect, and to be subject to leading questions for that whole, isn't it a fact that, isn't it a fact that, this was strange, did you find this odd, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was precluded from bringing up other things that you, the, your, your Honor thought, you know, was that didn't open the, far, the the door that wide, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just doing this for the record, obviously, because I, we, I didn't have a chance to do this while the jury was in the room. Um, I would note, Your Honor, that although the, these cases, there are cases that say that when I talk about general behavior, how people generally react, when they're being questioned, that there's basically, which I will note, I at no point asked Mr. Kimball, Officer Kimball, if, whether he thought that Michelle Draconis's body language suggests anything. I talked in general, people are educated, uneducated, people have experience of how they react in general. And that was the reason that Mr. McGinnis used for being able to ask specific things about Ms. Draconis, not about what people do in general. And so um, I submit that it not only invaded the province of the jury, but went directly to an opinion about my client's truthfulness, her credibility, that what she said was strange to him. Um, it, go, it went to her behavior, not in general to what people do in general. It violated um, all these, the law. It also, I note, Your Honor, um, If I could just for a moment note, there's there's even a section on in the uh, in uh, Judge Prescott's book, section seven point one zero point four, that talks about the impropriety of, of witnesses, talking about the credibility of other witnesses, other people. But I submit that it goes directly to um, uh, the right to a fair trial when it's credibility questions and suggestions about the defendant herself. I also, at this point, Your Honor, wanted to address an issue. Um, and I'll just note there are two other cases that I that I uh, wanted to bring to the court's attention. State versus Leniart, 198 Connecticut Appellate 591. It's a 2020 decision. It's well established that the federal constitution requires that criminal defendants be afforded a meaningful opportunity to complete, to present a complete defense um, and the right to offer the testament witness, witnesses to compel their attendance if necessary and in plain terms the right to present a defense uh, and the defendant's version of the facts as well as the prosecutions to the jury so that it may decide where the truth lies. So when yesterday the court said that the issue of Mr. or Dr. Herman's report is collateral, I submit, and this is going to come up, much of our defense is about what Ms. Traconis was told, not just by Fotis Dulos, but by lawyers, by others, that she was listening in, overhearing, and being told directly by the divorce lawyer by the guardian ad litem, the attorney for the children, about that. Now, there was a suggestion that anything about Dr. Herman's report is, quote, here to come up from the area near the Yukon Health Center that we saw in the commercial buildings that were in that part of, of uh, Farmington, correct? Uh, yeah, I believe you'd come off of, like, what, Talcott Notch Road? And from that area, maybe? Well, Talcott Notch, uh, we didn't talk about Talcott Notch, but Talcott Notch and Old Mountain Road, you have to cross both of those roads before you get to Route 4, right? I believe you do. And then you come to where the commercial areas are, including the uh, um, the gas stations, right? Yes. The 
the uh, medical buildings are down there. Correct. And then there's an entrance to I-84 in Farmington, right? Oh, there is. And if you go the other way on Route 4, eventually you go right into uh, West Hartford where there's a stop and shop, right? I believe so. And I just have a couple more questions. Um, did you, when, when you sh split up the review of, of the videos from 77 Mountain Spring Road with Detective Clabby, uh, did you consult with each other and discuss what each of you found or not? Oh, we did. Did you then go and view what he had looked at? No, I did not. He just told you what he had seen, right? I believe so, yes. And same thing with you. When you did your view, you didn't, he didn't come in and watch it. You just told him what you had seen. That's accurate. I have no further questions. Well, it's probably a better idea to uh, continue redirect uh, after the lunch and recess. Yes, Judge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will stand in our lunch and recess today until 10 minutes after 2. <laughs> Please uh, do not discuss the case. Have a good lunch. until 2 o'clock, please exit the courtroom.